chasm vast and wide, through which was flowing a swollen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The swollen stream had no fear for him. But he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength in building here. Your journey will end at the close of day. You will never again pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you a bridge at evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said. There followed after me today a fair-haired youth whose feet must pass this way. The chasm that has been not to me, to that fair-haired youth, may a pitfall be. He too must cross the twilight dim. Good friend, I build this bridge for him. This poem reminds me a lot of uh, the lesson this morning as we dig into 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we want to open your Bibles there. That will be our central text. And I've been given, given the, um, the blessing to uh, not only speak to you about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this week, but also next, next week. And so there are so many things in this chapter that, that tie together. So this will be um, a great opportunity for me to learn uh, and hopefully a blessing to you as we study 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a very powerful chapter uh, as Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. There are so uh, many things there. And in the church today, we have a lot of different kinds of people. And sometimes we have people who are oftentimes who are on the extremes in attitudes. And we can find this throughout the church or even in a specific congregation. And that is, at one extreme, is I can do everything. I remember in uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare, there's a, an actor who says, well, I can play that part. And I can do that part, too. And I can do that part, too. And sometimes we have members in the Lord's Church who try to do that. And there's another end of the extreme who say, hey, I can't do anything. There's nothing I can do. And so we're going to really look at that, those ideas today. Both attitudes are wrong. Uh, the first one is born of pride and selfishness. And sometimes it's, it's so much, it seems like it's so much easier just to do it yourself. You get, you know, it's done, it's done faster. Right? Well, I can do that. And without sharing that opportunity and allowing other people to do that. And sometimes... You know, when people don't do those things, if they step away or they go on a vacation for a little bit, it gives a chance for other people to learn that they too can participate, that they too can learn and they too can grow. And, uh, and that's such a wonderful thing. But also, the other one uh, is uh, not really understanding the value of every saint. Like when somebody says, I, there's really nothing I can contribute. And so, maybe you've all seen those posters in the doctor's office with all the human body parts. Well, we're going to look at chapter 12, and it really gives us a good look at some of those different parts. One of the things that people sometimes make a mistake with this particular chapter is just looking at the parts. Well, this is a part, and this is a part, and this is a part, and this is a part. And there's been so much emphasis on the individual parts. Sometimes we see the folly in that when different people sort of arise as leader and sometimes are held up at a different standard than everyone else. And sometimes they hold themselves up to a similar standard, you know, when, it, when it's told, you know, to you over and over again, you know, you're so wonderful and you write so well and you speak so well and you give, give great, lead great singing and you, you give a great class, you serve a great meal. And, then it's, you know, it feels like, hey, you know, this is really nice, you know, the people to recognize this. But at the same time, uh, we need to know that there, that isn't just about the parts, that ultimately, that all parts need to be joined together. 
for our unity as we were sharing in song just a bit ago and sharing in prayer that it's a harmonious and uh, an effective way that the church has been built. And so the emphasis over these next couple of Sundays will be on that, on the unity, not so much on each of the individual parts, although we'll mention that because that's a component of this particular chapter. But we need to make sure we're emphasizing the unity, the togetherness, and the oneness, and understanding the principle behind it rather than getting bogged down into the specific individual parts. Because parts change, in a way. And uh, people change, and they take on different roles, and, and different needs uh, occur, depending on a particular congregation or a particular moment. And so the parts often change, and so we ought not to get caught up in those things. And there were very specific parts in the, uh, the building of the New Testament church that were allocated for people of that very specific time. And we ought not to get caught up in grabbing those because that was their problem. <laughs> well, I've got this one, and particularly the gift of speaking in tongues. Now, historically, the reason for that is because many of the people who were, uh, who were involved at the Church of Corinth, who, been, who were new converts, had recently come from the pagan world and there were specific celebrations that were similar in nature. And so to be able to do this sort of thing was, you know, was uh, something that was considered to be a great honor. And it you know, soon sort of became this thing of elevation. And even in the Lord's Church today, there are particular roles like that. There are preachers who have developed a name for themselves, not just within the Lord's Church, but in other places. People go, oh yeah, I know who that person is, or I know who that person is, and, uh, and you could speak to them, and they, they might know, oh, I've read his book. And so we do the same thing, we can do the same thing today, just depending on what it is that we have this particular, want to elevate at that time. And we can also do that here within our body, and it's important that we recognize, first of all, that we are the body of Christ. The church is one body, and many members, emphasizing the one body. We're baptized into one body. Look at, specifically, verse 13. We're going to read our text here in just a moment. But, for by one spirit where we were all baptized into one body. Where, whether Jew or, or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Let's back up to verse 1, though. And we're going to read verses 1 through 20. I don't know if I'll get that far today. I'm not necessarily in a particular rush because whatever I don't get to today, guess what? I get to talk about it next week. So look at verse 1 now. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols however you were led. Therefore, I made known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, for common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. 
it is not for this reason, and the less a part of the body. And if the, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. So we were baptized into one body. We've been spending some time looking at Acts. And I uh, just wanted to go back there and look at, it's been a little bit, little while since we looked at Acts chapter 2. And I know that a lot of you are familiar with this passage. But it says in Acts chapter 2, and in verse 41 particularly says, So when those who had received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And also in verse 47, as they were having their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So the church is one body and many members. We are the body of Christ. The body can, and it's important that we recognize that the body can grow and that we need to make sure that we are doing our part to make sure that it can grow and function effectively. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, we read a little bit about this again in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's such an important concept that he writes it over and over again to, the, to the, the churches that were growing. In chapter 4 and verse 15, he says, well, as opposed to speaking with craftiness and deceitful scheming, in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And there's an important concept here. There are many, but one I wanted to highlight here just for a moment. At the very beginning of verse 15, it says, but speaking the truth in love. And we talk about the idea of unity. It's important that we are unified in truth and in love. There are some groups of people who get together uh, on the Lord's Day and they don't necessarily agree on much, other than Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and they said, you know, we agree that's true. He is the Son of God. But everything else, they say, is sort of up in the air. But that's not all of it, as we know. That's not the whole picture. It's an, it's a, an essential part. It is our focus. But that's not its entirety. They have gotten together and they've said, we, are, we disagree on so many things, but while we're together, we will focus on this idea that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's the Son of God. And everything else we may or may not agree upon, but we're going to worship together because it, it works out. It's convenient. And we can pool our money together. Another concept that's similar to that I've seen in different churches, so that they'll have different start times. So there's eight, there's the eight o'clock group, and then there's the ten o'clock group, and there's a noon group, and there's a two o'clock group. Well, you know, and if they got a big enough community, there's a four o'clock group, and they because they have different things, different ways that they worship God, that they feel comfortable with, and that comfort is, you know, what they are going for. It's comfortable and it's convenient. And so they have these different things, and the reality is then they have basically different groups of people meeting together and pooling their money. That's the end result, right? There's, no, there's, not, there's not unity. Uh, they're sharing the same building. We call it union in a way, you know, because we've all agreed to share the same building. But the reality is it's just different groups of people meeting together. And so we have to be aware of that for ourselves too, that we are that we are speaking truth and that we are doing so in love and that we are helping each other grow in both of those elements. 
And there are going to be some areas that are, that are not related specifically to salvation that we may not necessarily agree on exactly. Um, but the, those elements of salvation and how we worship and those kinds of things, it seems to be pretty essential as Paul writes these letters to, you know, to different churches that, that there is uh, an expectation in worship and that there, that there are expectations as far as what is essential to salvation. And so we need to make sure that we are doing that in both truth and love. The body illustrates our unity in Christ. Also um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, um, beginning in verse 3, it says, Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. So along with love and gentleness and patience. Uh, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in hope of your calling. So that oneness and that unity in truth and in love um, is essential. Secondly, the body or the church has many members. We do need to recognize that that is part of the text here, is that there are different members and there are different uh, gifts that we have. God has designed the church to, though ultimately to achieve his purposes. Notice in verse 18 of our text, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired, not as each member has desired, but how, what God desires. And that's what the other thing that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to. It's not just, this is what I want to do, um, but what it is, what is it that God wants to do? And so we can reflect a little bit about that and in our prayer and in our study and allowing that study through God's word and the Holy Spirit to be able to guide us in that. And it's also applied specifically to uh, miraculous gifts, as we notice a number of those in chapter 12. And I, about a month from now, I get an opportunity to focus on the tongue, speaking in tongues. And uh, it's, you know, it's a challenging area because uh, there are people who, who uh, believe that they're practicing that particular thing, you know, today. And that, and have elevated that gift once again, just as the Corinthians did. That's really sort of the, the irony of it is, is that once again, even though it's, um, it's, not, um, it's not the same, because what they had then, and I, wanna, I don't wanna, I wanna load all of that out now, but I'll, I'll of course touch it on, on that again in about a month. What they had then was, it was an actual language that could be understood. It was, a, it was an earthly language, and it was meant specifically so that uh, they could teach and that people could understand each other and what they were saying. And in, the, in that case, uh, you wouldn't need somebody to, to, to do it, to speak in that language, and then turn around and somebody else say, well, this is what it means. Uh, but if it, were, cause it were, if it were a true and accurate language, then people would go, oh, well, that's something that I can identify, and this is what it translates to me. But we'll talk about that more later. But the, the point being is that that was, that was uh, one of those gifts, or was the gift that people were, the Church of Corinth was saying, hey, this is the one, and this is what elevates certain people as more spiritual or stronger Christians because they have this particular gift. But... Even though we have different gifts, it's the same spirit. Look at verse 4. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord in verse 5. And there are different activities or works that we do, but it's the same God. And the same Holy Spirit that um, was poured out upon the apostles... Uh, is the same Holy Spirit that blesses us with specific gifts and also that uh, is in, indwells within us. Now, it's manifested differently, but it's the same Spirit. And we need to keep that in mind. It has the same power and has that power ultimately of unifying us, not only with each other, but with Jesus Christ himself. And... So it's important that we recognize that element of unity. 
The, the Corinthian Christians had coveted the gift of speaking tongues, and it was something that they viewed in higher esteem, as I mentioned before. And they go through all these different gifts that we talked about. These listed functions, they're not the objective of the 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're not the objective of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Corinthians have lost sight of God's true purpose. And God's true purpose and his intentions for those gifts was to unify, was to edify, to bring about the, the how they can work together as a whole church and then to bring the message to others. We needed to, and we needed to be brought back to the basics. It identifies those gifts and then instructs the Corinthians to see their objective as not benefiting individuals, but benefiting the whole church and then in turn glorifying God. Paul explains to the Corinthians that the church is not comprised of one member, but many. Whatever individuals in the church do ought to be done in consideration of others, in consideration of the whole. And we've talked about this before as a common thread through 1 Corinthians, this idea of not just doing for yourself, but doing for others and making sure that in that we are blessing the whole, the whole body, and therefore glorifying God and being prepared to deliver the message throughout our community and through the world. Notice how Paul addresses the question of spiritual gifts in 1 through 3, as I mentioned before. Uh, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. I, don't want you to, I, I want you to understand this. This is an important idea here. So what's a gift? A gift, a spiritual gift, is translated more as favor. In other words, something you didn't earn. So if... Speaking in tongues is this sort of great thing that elevates you somehow, uh, or prophecy, or wisdom, or whatever that, that is listed here. It, that is, how does that make sense? If it's a favor that God has given you, not because you've earned it, but because he needs to, to use you right there and then to be able to be a, 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 a tool, in a sense, uh, to bring the gospel, to edify the church. So it's not anything that people earn. It's something that God has said, here you go. This is something that will help uh, grow the church and grow the body. The gifts were God's favor to Christians to uh, prove to the world that God is the one and only God. It was also in, uh, to confirm the word spoken by the miracle worker as being of a divine origin, so whoever is working that miracle. It was used to produce faith in those who witnessed the gifts. And it was used to display God's mercy. And this chapter reveals to edify and unify the local church. And there are 13 of these gifts that are specifically mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And you can look through those for yourself. But he's talking, the Apostle Paul did not want the Corinthians to be Ignorant uh, is another good translation for the word unaware. Ignorant of the gift's purpose. What is the purpose of the gifts? Apparently, the Corinthians had lost sight of the objective of those gifts. They had been taken away from what God's real objectives were and focused on self. Verse 2 there says, You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols, however you were led. And I like that play on words. You know, speaking in tongues was their emphasis, but the idols are dumb. Right? They can't speak. And so that's what he's setting up is here. Is you, you know, you think that you can speak something so important, but you're taking this from the dumb idols, the, the idols that can't speak. Through these spiritual matters or gifts, God has made manifest was made manifest. The idols of God's worship, on the other hand, had no such manifestation because they were dumb or speechless. Over in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, for example, it says, No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God, and I do not want you to become sharers in demons. The Gentiles were led away into those dumb idols by Satan. And that is our common enemy. When you look at this idea of unity in truth and in love, 
uh, we need to make sure that we recognize that we have that common enemy, and that's Satan. Now, if we recognize uh, falsehood, for example, and uh, that is that battle against Satan. And if we make sure that we unify under that, then other things really sort of become irrelevant. Then he goes on in verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed, and no one saying Jesus is Lord except, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, it does, that doesn't mean literally if somebody says that, you know, that they, that only is by the Holy Spirit. What that means is if you're saying it in truth, right? If you're saying it as you mean it, right? Rather than just people flippantly saying things like that, because they do. Um, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about that sincere, truthful, honest expression, Jesus is Lord. And the only way to do that is by the Holy Spirit. One who would claim that Jesus is anathema or accursed can only do so through ignorance and a spirit of dumbness. The living God moves man to speak divine things for divine purposes. The ignorant and dumb do things for selfish purposes that have no real backing other than that of Satan. A conclusive test is now given to the Corinthians that they may determine who is performing gifts according to divine influence and who is not. The Apostle John gives a test as well that is all may know who is truly in fellowship with God when he said, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Uh, over in 1 John 3.10, and there's that great emphasis. So how do we know that we are of God? Well, those who obey, you're practicing righteousness. It's, it's that, that simple. It's through obedience. And part of that obedience is loving our brother. And that's what helps, and sisters, that's what helps create the unity that we're looking for. And we have to think about that. How do we do that? How do we practice that? Paul's test is likewise simple. If one were to call Jesus anathema or accursed, he is certainly not doing so of God. Jesus is not devoted to evil, and neither is our Lord accursed, because the idol is dumb and cannot speak. So it's this unity and truth and love. Conversely, one who would claim Jesus is Lord is in the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John said, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. Apparently there were false teachers and or selfish brethren. A lot of times people say, you know, we really want to pattern ourselves after the New Testament church. Yes, but not necessarily through their, you know, their specific example. We don't want to be like the church at Corinth. Uh, I mean, maybe there's some things, yes, but we don't want to go through these, these difficulties. And so when we talk about patterning ourselves out of the New Testament church, we're talking about as it was laid down by Jesus and, and the ideas and the principles that are pure and right and righteous. So Paul is clearly telling the Corinthian brethren that we can determine whether a teacher is false by his doctrine. The spirit of truth and spirit of error is clearly distinguishable through the doctrine brought forth. Therefore, a man speaking from God or against God would be known by the words, by his words. In the early church, God gave various miraculous powers referred to by Paul as gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as we notice in verses 4 through 11, we read that there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. Let's look at that text again. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God. Notice the emphasis there is on the sameness of the Spirit and the sameness of God, who works all things in all persons, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy and to another the distinguishing spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. So I know I repeated the same text, but it's such an important passage. And we recognize that, not just as a list of possible things we can pull from. Oh, I like that. 
Let's do that. Um, but that we see that as God's power uh, to unify. That is all, whatever gifts that we have is all through one spirit. We've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, meaning he, as we are baptized, he indwells in us. That's the gift. Okay? And so these other things are their blessings and their gifts in the sense that uh, they've been given to us. Like if you happen to be um, uh, great at serving others, if you happen to be terrific at leading singing, if you happen to be you know, good at making things for other people, uh, those are things that God has blessed us with, but we have not earned them. And sometimes people say, well, I deserve this. I deserve this. I deserve this. No. <laughs> no. And the, the, the thing is, those things can be taken away. You know, just like that. Or they can, we can uh, be allowed to keep those things and they could destroy it. And there are lots of examples in the Bible where that happens. So, and we know there, there are examples of that in modern day times. There are great speakers that, who have come from the Lord's Church and moved on to other areas. Uh, but they still have the gift of great speaking. So, but, it's, but it has, ultimately, it was that gift that God blessed them with that ended up taking them away from God in the end. They were drawn by money. They were drawn by fame and power and those kinds of things. But it was that gift that God gave them that actually became the thing that would destroy. And that can, do, that can happen to, to anyone. And that's something to be aware of. So I'm going to wrap this up for today because I do have other things to share on this particular topic. But I don't want to rush it. And I have next week also to talk about this. But I do want to give a couple quick applications here. And we'll come back to these same applications again next week because they are so crucial. One is we must respect our head, the head of the body, which is Christ. So looking over in Colossians, for just a moment, chapter 3 and verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him to God the Father. So regardless of whatever part we are, uh, we must respect the head, and the head of the body is Christ. And there are other examples in the New Testament that refer to it in that particular way, and Paul does that quite often. We must respect the head in what we believe, and what we teach, and what we practice. We must respect the head in and insist on Bible authority. By it, meaning Bible authority, our head directs us. So that's the first application. The second one is, we must do our part so the body properly functions. Remember in Ephesians, chapter 4 and verse 16. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Individuals function which works for the good of the whole. When you or I do not do our part, the body suffers. So are you teaching or will you teach a Bible class? Are you praying for your brethren? Are you encouraging others in word and in action? Those are all ways that we can serve. And some people are better at it than others. And you may be one of those who is great at encouraging and I encourage you to continue with that. Are you bearing your blessings instead of using them to help the church and glorify our Lord? Or are you using or abusing the gift of time the Lord gives us? And that is a gift as well. We've all been given that one. And th that comes in different amounts. Sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, as far as the whole picture. So what are you doing with that great gift? And then finally, third, we must endeavor to keep unity in truth and in love among us. Uh, in 1212. And also be aware that there should be no schism, rent, or rupture. That's over in, in verse 25, which all in 
1 Corinthians 12, which I'll get to more next week. But it says that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. A fractured body is unable to function adequately. It takes a long time to heal, and without proper care, leads to a lifetime of pain. And one of the great ways that, that we can, can do this can, and can be a blessing and can be unified, and I think it's an important one, is that we continue to work to spend time with each other, to, uh, to do things together. It doesn't necessarily mean that each person is going to spend the exact amount of time with one person as they will another. That's not, that doesn't make sense. Uh, because Jesus himself, you know, spent more time with some people than he did with others. And their apostles spent certain amounts of time with certain people. So we ought not be jealous if that happens. But we do need to recognize that we need to continue to make that effort to make sure we're spending time because that's the way that the body remains unified, right? And that we are meeting together once a week or, or some people come on Wednesdays and that's a great and powerful thing. Uh, but it's not necessarily uh, enough, and, because the, and we know that because the Bible provides us with a different kind of example. And the different kinds of example is that they were meeting together very often, right? And making sure that they have those connections. So in conclusion, none of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. May everything we do honor Christ and his body, the church. So that kind of fits in with our theme this year, which is the glorious church, right? And so uh, we need to continue to pray for that. And uh, the invitation is yours at this point. So if you want to think about those things, if you have specific needs, certainly you're welcome to come uh, forward as we sing the song. But, but also if you, if you have prayer concerns, and I, I know that our brother Daniel has encouraged us to do this, go to each other and ask for Ask for that person to pray with you. And that can be a powerful thing too. It doesn't have to be in front of everybody. Uh, but also, if you're not a Christian...